So, Dr. Yates, we're going to do this. We're going to do it. <laughs> I, I, think, um, I think it's time. Yeah. Uh, and, and this was a tough decision for me. I, um, you know, I, I mentioned that, uh, you know, I, I wanted to make sure that I was doing it for the right reasons and, and maybe take myself and the people watching this through the process of how this is going to work. Okay. That's a good question. So what we do, the hair in the back and the sides is permanent hair. We call that the donor area. So like on this model here, all these little dots here, this is permanent hair. So what we do, we kind of rearrange the resources. This is supply and this is demand. Right. Okay. So everybody has that uh, inequality of supply versus demand. So we take hair from this area of the permanent zone and move it to where the hair is not permanent. So a lot of people think, well, say if we take some hair, like say we take this as a hair and move it up here. They always ask me, they say, well, the hair that was up here anyway fell out. So why, if you move a hair from here to here, doesn't it fall out? And that's a valid question. And the answer to that is the hair in the back and on the sides is genetically different than the hair on top of the head. So when we take this hair from the back and sides that's genetically different and plant it up here in the scalp, the hormones that make you lose the hair originally do not affect this hair. Now, your process is different than the traditional, right? The, the, I think one of the, the first uh, transplants where they, they would do an incision, right? And almost right. take a patch of your skin out. Right. And then you'd have that, that scar, right? That linear scar. But you're That's literally taking individual hair follicles out. Yes, yes. And the way hair grows is from one hair, it's like shrubbery one hair to four hair groupings. So we, I actually punch out these groupings one by one in the back of the head. And the trick is you want to do it because you're robbing Peter, this is Peter, to pay right. Paul. You don't grow any more hair back here. So you have to do it in a mosaic pattern so when you rob Peter back here, you don't rob him blind and now it looks like you have a divot here and hair up here. But we take individual hairs, no cut. And you use literally a tiny little punch, right? Almost like a, a, a teeny tiny straw yes. where you go over the hair follicle, yes. grab it, go into the skin and pull it out. Correct, correct. We have a, a 0.8 millimeter punch or even smaller than that that we surround the hair follicle, go down and core it and then kind of take it out. Yes, we do it one by one. When you take that hair, what do you do with it when you first remove it? Do you put? You Put it on a plate? What do, you, what do you do with it? That's a good question. So what we do, say here's the hair here. So say I were to punch this unit out. We place it in a dish with a preservative, the same type of preservatives used in the hospital to hold for kidney transplants, liver transplants. So it's placed in a cryopreservative solution okay. that keeps the graft fresh and moist until we plant it up top. So usually you should plant these hairs back as fast as you can because when you remove them, you're cutting it off from their life bloodstream. So, so you want to do it as quick as you can once you get it out. I'd say, you know, two hours is a reasonable time period between when you take it out and put it back in. Now this procedure, obviously I'm a man, but this is not uh, unique to men. This is a procedure you do on both men and women, correct? That's correct. And um, also not just hair on top of the head, right? You do other work as well. Give me some examples yeah, of that. To us, hair is hair. Like a lot of men can't grow beards. You know, like nowadays that lumberjack look is in, you know, right. short on the sides and lumberjack. So a lot of guys are coming in and said, hey, I, I can't grow a beard, you know, just in my jeans. So we do the same thing. We go back here, supply and demand. We rob Peter, take the hair, and we can just take these hairs and put them here and make a beard. That looks like it hurts right there. It, on the chair. Yeah, it, it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> Once we numb you up. Right, right, right. That looked brutal, but we took take the hair. We can make beards. We can make mustaches. We right. do eyebrows as well. Right. You know. Um, now let's talk about the process. So um, I'm going to... I'm going to, well, I'm going to let you talk about the process. When we get started, how's it going to work? Okay. Basically, it's three steps. The first step is numbing the back of the head. You know, we always want to, you know, assess the donor, get the hair out. So we punch all the hair out that we're going to need. Um, we place it in a preservative solution. Um, then we numb up the top or whatever area we're working on. To me, this is the most critical area. We didn't discuss that from what you can see, we call this the money shot. Like when somebody, like this guy walks in the room, everybody's head is shaped differently. Right. So we find out where the maximum point of his scalp is and past that point you can't really see. So we kind of spend most of our time from here forward because that's when he walks in the room what people see. Right. So we always want to concentrate in here. So we would numb this area up and 
make the incisions or the, the plan for how the graphs are going to go in here. That's step two. Step three is putting in the graphs and then we're pretty much done. Usually if we do like an average case is 1500 to 2000 of these graphs, that'll take us from eight in the morning to around three in the afternoon. And then are you actually um, by hand sort of designing where you place all these follicles? Uh, yes. Yeah. Before we start, we'll draw up the hairline, we'll draw up the temples, wherever we're going to put the hair, we'll kind of map it out. We make the incisions actually the same direction and angles that your hair grows. So we give you back what you already have. I'm wearing microscopic glasses so I can see, say, an electron move across your scalp. And when you take the, the donor hair from the back and the side of, of my uh, scalp, what will that look like? Will my other, other hair just grow in over the top of where you took the donors? That's a good question. Uh, when we take the hair out from the back and the sides, that hair is gone. We always say it's robbing Peter to pay Paul. The trick of the whole thing is we're thinning the back and the sides to make the front thicker, but we have to do it in a pattern that looks good. So that's kind of the skill of it. Even though we're thinning it, it still has to look good. When I walk out of here uh, after doing this procedure, uh, what am I going to look like? It isn't, it isn't the type of thing, you know, we've discussed this, but for people watching, it isn't like I'm going to walk out of here with this full head of hair. No. When we take the hair from the donor, it's kind of, we buzz the hair down so it looks like five o'clock shadow. So when we move it to the front, it's going to look like five o'clock shadow. It's purely farming, as I tell patients. So it's going to take time for that hair to grow. Usually it starts to grow at three months. So we tell people, you know, three months, four months, you'll start to see something. It takes a full year for the thing, for the process to finish. Dr. Yates, tell me about your background because uh, this whole venture for you uh, is not something you spent your whole career doing. No, no it's not. Well, my first career, when I went into medical school, I wanted to be a cancer surgeon. My um, mother died of cancer when I was 14, so it was traumatic and you know I didn't want anybody else to lose their parents. So as it turned out, I became a trauma surgeon. Did traditional medicine, ran an ICU, and I'm born and raised in Chicago, went to Northwestern, and throughout my whole life, say when I was in high school, my hair started to thin. And it really started to bother me then you know, in high school. Right. In my early 20s, I was in medical school and didn't have really time to pay attention to it, but by the time I became a resident and a fellow, I was just, you know, sick of, I was pretty bald, even balder than you. I have a picture back here, I don't know if you can see, I'm gonna take it down, um, a picture of me when I was like running an ICU, I was just 29 years old here. You know, a lot of people don't even think that's me because my hairline was back here. Right. So one night I was watching TV and saw an infomercial for hair transplant. You know, and I said, hey, without doing any research or anything at all, I just went there and had a hair transplant. It worked miraculously. Well, not miraculously. To me, it was miraculously, but they, whatever they promised, they delivered. Wow. So I, since that time, and I was in my late 30s, I was sold on the whole hair transplant phenomenon. Tell me about some of the uh, comments that you get uh, when, when, from these patients. I mean, now with thousands of procedures under your belt, um, I'm sure you've heard it all. But yes. what are the most common things that you hear from, from your past patients? Well, the most common is, I wish I had done it earlier. I'd say I hear that 90% of the patients. You know, they would say, I don't know what I waited for. I don't know why I was scared. Um, you know, they had heard horror stories of plugs or lines in the back or hair shooting up in different directions. So that's number one. Number two is I look younger. Everyone says I look like I lost weight. Number three, I have more confidence. I feel more like myself. And you can just see a difference when they come back in the office, you know, a year later, you know, they have that little swag that they didn't have before that you can't really describe. So Great information. Yeah. So I guess the next thing is we get going. Let's do it. All right.